Let's talk about chaos this year in college football, shall we? Tom Fornelli over on CBSSports.com wrote an article about chaos teams. And I looked at it, and I liked it, and I said, I think we'll steal that. Right here in broad daylight, in front of God and everyone, we're going to steal his idea. I've got five chaos teams of my own, and I don't think there's much overlap with Fornelli, so let's talk about it. The first one is Iowa State. This is where I'm conflicted. You, you remember, if you've been around for a little while, the tragedy that befell me and Iowa State, us. We suffered immensely last year because I bought in. I dove in. I drank the Kool-Aid. That, that red and yellow Hulk Hogan flavored Kool-Aid, I drank it. We were in Ames week two last year. The Renaissance Tour went on the road and we saw Iowa State, I think they just turned it over again. They, they turned it over and, and, and turned it over again and again and again. They lost the game to Iowa. So anyway, I was ridiculed and mocked unmercifully and still am to this day. And yet when I was looking over Iowa State's prospects for this year, a lot of folks are telling you, well, they can't do anything this year because they lost Brock Purdy. Well, they can't do anything this year because they lost Breeze Hall. Well, they can't do anything this year because they lost X percentage of their production from last year. And then I'm looking around saying, didn't this team go 7-6 and six last year? I'm not going to shed much of a tear if that kind of topsoil is eroding. Now, this is not a team and not a program that stacked 5-star upon 5-star upon 5-star. But what I do know is internally... There is a lot of excitement about Hunter Deckers at quarterback up there. They won't say it publicly, but I'll say it as sort of the unofficial spokesperson for Iowa State. They think he's going to end up being better than Brock Purdy. Offensively, they think they'll end up being net positive this year relative to what they were last year. And need I remind you folks, probably because you weren't paying attention to their tackle rotation, they had to kick guards out to tackle last year. They had some pretty key injuries there. So am I making excuses? Absolutely. I don't want to just say I was wrong last year. And so I'm not predicting them to go to the playoff. What I'm asking you to do, humbly but forcefully, is look at the schedule. Yes, they play Baylor early, so they're, they're less banged up. They got them at home. They go to Texas October 15th. They play the entire Big 12. That's how they roll in the Big 12. My point is, this is the team... If there's any this year that fell short of expectation last year that could end up just being a year late to the party. I don't think there's this steep, massive drop-off like some other people think there will be. I, I told you earlier today on Twitter, I'm going to irrationally buy into them unless you talk me out of it. And a bunch of you tried to talk me out of it, including some close personal friends in the state of Iowa. So I'm not fully diving in. I, I just I didn't dive in. I toothpicked in. But I'm in with Iowa State again this year. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I'm ready to be hurt again. Next up, Mississippi State. I've got so much on Mississippi State, I have a post-it above and beyond the notes in front of me, which are minimal. NFL scouts, told you about them earlier. They've been traipsing through the Magnolia State. Uh, NFL scouts, the same ones that talked about Zach Evans, said this is the sneakiest, most loaded roster in America, Mississippi State. I try and tell you guys, the ones who make fun of folks who tout these SEC schedules all the time, and you'll look at a team like Mississippi State. Jesse, what's their over-under win total? Do you have that in there? I mean, it's not 9 or 10. Like, it's, it's not up there in the Georgia-Bama territory. Their over-under win total six and a half. Okay? This is where we have to hammer home the reminder that in college football, all wins and losses are not created equal. A win is not just a win. Uh, you're not always what your record says you are. Those are some of the big lies they try and tell you about our sport. You are very much a prisoner or a beneficiary, of what your strength of schedule is. Well, this year, I mean, Mississippi State, let me, let me see their schedule right quick. There's a stretch in October that is illegal in like 27 states. They play Texas A&M. They play Arkansas. They go to Kentucky, which is the number two team in the SEC East in preseason odds. And then they go to Alabama. And then if that's not enough, they're going to play Auburn the next game. Then they play Georgia the next game. It just never ends. So, Here's why they're a chaos team. You look at that schedule, and you would be right in saying, like producer Jesse said earlier, that's about the toughest four-game stretch I've seen for anyone in America this year. You're not wrong, kids. You're not wrong. Here's why I want to let you know Mississippi State is still going to do something terrible to someone this year. The Texas A&M game, do me a favor and keep their schedule up. The Texas A&M game, yeah, they play A&M. A&M, the week before, plays against Arkansas in Dallas. 
A&M, the week after Mississippi State, has that game at Alabama. So that trip to Starkville is sandwiched in between those two games. Not easy. Uh, Mississippi State plays Arkansas there on October 8th. Arkansas is coming off back-to-back games versus A&M and at home against Alabama. Those are back-to-back brutal body blow games, not to mention that's a Super Bowl atmosphere Arkansas will have for Alabama. Then they take a trip to Starkville the next week. We call that a double do down spot out in the desert. Next up, Mississippi State, they have to play Alabama. It's a tough spot. Alabama will be coming off a three-game stretch of at Arkansas, home versus A&M, at Tennessee, and then they get Mississippi State. That's the toughest three-game stretch on Bama's schedule this season. You could not pick a better spot to play Bama if you have to play Bama. It's not over yet. Mississippi State plays Auburn. Mississippi State's off a bye. Auburn will be coming off a game against Arkansas. And keep in mind, who knows what status that program's in at Auburn at that point. And here's the one that a lot of folks who follow Mississippi State closely are circling as the big upset in the SEC this year. They play Georgia. Really late in the year, they play them November 12th. Georgia will be coming off a game in Jacksonville, in Jacksonville against Florida. They play Tennessee at home. They go to Mississippi State, and that's the week before they also go to Kentucky. So every one of those situations, in one, two, three, four, five of the toughest games Mississippi State plays this year, they own the schedule dynamic advantage, or at least I think they do. So this is not a segment about who's going to make the playoff. It's not a segment about who's going to win the West. It's a segment about who is going to make children in some of these opposing fan bases cry themselves to sleep at night. That's what a chaos team does. They they just, they bring wailing, they bring gnashing of toofies, and I think that's going to happen with Mississippi State at some point this year. No skill in picking where, but I think it's going to happen. I did uh, Sirius Pac-12 radio earlier today with Mike Yam and Guy Haberman, and we spent an inordinate amount of time, an irresponsible amount of time, talking about Washington and Washington State. And I'm not going to make that go to waste. So let's, let's let that have served as show prep. Washington could be a chaos team this year. You don't know anything about Washington. Half the folks in Seattle don't know anything about the University of Washington this year. Just own it. Just be real about it. I know that. Kalen DeBoer is the new head coach here. Kalen DeBoer is about as polar opposite from Jimmy Lake, the outgoing head coach, as you could possibly get. And by outgoing, I mean fired. There's going to be an immediate turnaround here offensively. Immediate. I don't know if it's going to be quantum or just a big step, but there will be a a big turnaround statistically, uh, offensively there. Here's what you need to know. Here's why they're a chaos team. They have a sneaky good offensive talent roster. They've got two or three guys at quarterback who, uh, once upon a time, coming out of the recruiting world, looked like they had a lot of promise. They've got Penix, Michael Penix. Remember that kid? that played at Indiana and then got hurt every single year, literally every single year he's played, well, he transferred to Washington. they got a couple of left-handed quarterbacks up there right now. My point is, Kalen DeBoer is going to figure out a way to have a competent forward-facing offense. I don't think I've ever said that before. With one of those guys, they are better than you think they are at wide receiver. They're better than you think they are at running back. They don't play Utah this year. They don't play USC in the regular season this year. They go to Oregon late in the year. Washington... I know they got to replace a couple of corners that departed to the NFL. This is going to be a team that has strong Tennessee vibes. And by that, I mean you got a defensive coach who didn't really know what he was doing, who's gone. And then you got an offensive coach who takes over in year one. There's a lot of transition, and they probably lose some games in heartbreaking fashion, but they end up a little bit as an overachiever in year one under the new staff. That's what Tennessee was under Hypo last year. You mark my words, that's what Washington will be this year. Texas Tech. Are we going to go there? Yes. Let's go to Lubbock. Cactus time. Texas Tech. I will call them, at least in terms of preseason, the most enigmatic team that I have looked at. I have no clue what to expect. I went on Twitter earlier today. I asked you guys, who do you think the chaos team in college football will be this year? And I think our Stanley Scott, or the streets would call him Trey, said Texas Tech. And so I looked into Texas Tech, and I... I've observed the program, and I've observed the transformation going on out there under Joey McGuire. Now, here's what you got to be careful of, and I'm not comparing Joey McGuire to anyone because every coach is his own coach, but you got to be careful. I've suffered from this before. When infectious personality coaches come in and they take over a program, 
and they're, they're so outgoing and they're charismatic and they interact with everyone. It's hard not to, it, it's hard to ignore them and it's hard not to like them. And so you do. And then you let your own personal feelings overlap with your football predictions and you end up looking like an idiot. So I'm not doing that yet, but I do feel that way about Joey McGuire. I'm just not going quite out on that limb yet, but Texas Tech feels like a program just ready to explode. I'm talking underrated a lot on the show tonight. I, I've been to Lubbock before. 95% of the audience has not. Lubbock is, um, how should I explain? Jesse, Colin, you've never been to Lubbock, no, and you don't have a mic anyway. It's like its own world. It's not off the, it's not like you have to, you know, hop five different flights to get there, probably two or three. I'm just saying I'm not referring to it like it's an outpost in the Arctic Circle, but it's out there a little ways. The first prairie dog, I think the first and only prairie dog I've ever seen was in Lubbock. Uh, they are as plentiful there as squirrels are in Columbus, Georgia, but... It's a program that almost has like a high school on steroids vibe to the fan base. High school football in Texas is obviously its own world, but it feels so tribal and territorial in the best of ways. Texas Tech's fan base is like that, only on a much grander scale because it's a full-blown college. They got classes and everything. If someone lights the dynamite there, like once upon a time they did with Graham Harrell and Michael Crabtree and that squad that came through there in the latter aughts, it will be a magical, magical time. Now, you also need to remember, the Big 12 is wide open right now, and Texas and OU are about to leave the Big 12, so it's all in front of Texas Tech. This year, they've got the second longest odds to win the Big 12 in the conference. One or two years away, probably, in terms of a rebuild. That doesn't mean they can't upset someone this year. And so the last one I wanted to look at, and this one a lot of you mentioned, so I just wanted to give them a little cursory glance, is Boston College. I talked about Boston College a couple of months ago, and I think it was in a schedule segment. And the reason is because in terms of scheduling, if we're talking about them being a chaos team, what's the first thing you think about? If I'm talking about anyone pulling any upset in the ACC, you're thinking, oh, he must be talking about their chances to beat Clemson. Yep, that's what I'm talking about with Boston College. So a quick look at the Boston College schedule tells you they play Clemson October 8th. A lot of big games on October 8th. That's the day A&M goes to Bama. Uh, but that is the day that Clemson ventures up north to play Boston College. Now, as you know, we're all about dynamics around here. So it's not just that that game happens that day. It's that Clemson will have played at Wake Forest and NC State the week before they go to Boston College. And oh, by the way, they've got a trip to Florida State on deck the next week. Scheduling dynamic advantage, advantage Boston College. Quarterback dynamic advantage, Phil Dracovic versus DJ, maybe, Kate Klubnik, also maybe. So we'll see about that. But at the very least, there's a puncher's chance because of the way that schedule pans out. Chaos teams, it's going to happen. Don't let your heart get broken. Understand the way the sport works, and I will be happy to look at your suggestions in the comments.